preach the book of Jeremiah today. And in Jeremiah, we go to chapter 15. And the context of the second half of the chapter is, of course, the first half. And the time in which Jeremiah lived was so bad that God said that if Moses or Samuel stood before him in prayer for that nation, he would not have his mind towards that people for good. They were so wicked that he was done with them, and it didn't matter what any man of God prayed. And I think he said this to Jeremiah just to make a point. But then um, down further, we want to look at <coughs> verses uh, 15 through the end, through verse 21. And there's a statement made in verse 21 to Jeremiah, and I'll put it in context as we go along. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Uh, this is speaking specifically to Jeremiah of a physical redemption from the invading armies, and also from, more so, his enemies amongst the, quote, professing people of God from the princes and king of Judah and all their minions because they hated Jeremiah because he had the word of God and he was faithful to preach it. And that resulted in him having some issues, <laughs> some problems. Uh, and we'll go to that verse where he says what his problem is. Verse 10, Woe is me, my mother that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. It's important to remember that Jeremiah was a prophet, not just to the nation of Israel, but to the whole earth, because his prophecy is recorded in the Bible, and therefore he speaks as a man to the whole world, not just to Israel. He has a ministry that goes beyond his grave to all nations and all people and all kindreds and all tongues all over the face of the earth. And he is a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. Because the earth and the people therein are wicked, any Christian finds that at some point they are an individual, a man or a woman of strife and contention. Because you can't get along with these people that hate God, that hate your Savior, and that love death. You can only get along with them in a very superficial sense. But there can be no deep bond of communion between you and them. He said, I have neither lent on usury nor men have lent to me on usury. Yet every one of them doth curse me. The whole people around him, save a very few individuals, cursed him, hated him, and wished for his death. The Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. This came to pass. He was given deliverance out of the pit wherein was mire that he'd sunk in up to his neck. And he was given deliverance by the heathen king that came in with the invading army. And he was given release by the heathen king and allowed to go wherever he wanted to go. And he was given food and raiment and cared for by the people that were busy judging the backsliders and the wicked. He was cared for by them. Shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? Thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the spoil without price, and that for all thy sins, even in all thy borders. There's national judgment spoken of here. Um, if you know in our nation right now, what's happening is that we now have a communist fascist dictatorship. It's outwardly, and with our president, communist in its speech and rhetoric, but really it's fascist. Because even though he professes a form of communism, what he's doing is fascist. When you declare to corporations with charters from the federal government that you will control and determine what they can pay their executives, what they cannot do, and what they can do, then you have fascism, which is really a state corporate conglomeration where the state controls and regulates the corporations, but the state also doles out and gives deals to the corporations and gives exclusive rights to certain business um, operations both nationally and internationally, gives them a monopoly, you would call it. It's fascism. And that's exactly what was going on in Jeremiah's time. It was no different. 
The king was an autocrat who ruled uh, as a despot and by whim. And that's essentially what we have now on, of course, our president and the previous presidents. There's no difference between Obama and Bush and Clinton and Bush Sr. and uh, all the rest of them. They're simply a figurehead. They're an extension of some greater colossus power that is underneath and yet above them. And I believe that that's how these people in uh, Israel ruled. The kings ruled by um, the help of the princes, and the princes were wicked, so they were all in agreement. And they could have a hereditary monarchy as long as the hereditary monarch was evil. When he was a good one, that guy ran into a lot of trouble trying to straighten things out over and over again. You were reading the history of the Bible. So God gives them over to judgment. He said, I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not, for a fire is kindled in mine anger which shall burn upon you. Now, the next um, two paragraphs, if you have in your Bible paragraph notations, these are the sections I want to deal with because the very essence of Reformation truth and personal walk with God is in here. Um, o Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. A man can't pray that unless he knows God. He can't pray that in sincerity and truth and believe it unless he has a personal relationship with God and knows that God will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. Remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Over and over the theme in Jeremiah is vengeance against enemies. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Have you ever been rebuked by someone for the sake of the Lord because you took a stand and said something? Have you ever lost anything that you could have had if you would have just shut your mouth, but you didn't? That's what's going on here with Jeremiah. He would not have suffered rebuke. He could have been amongst the priest in Anatoth, and he could have um, been left alone to live out his life uh, unmolested by the wicked. And then he could have gone and been killed with all the rest of the wicked people. <laughs> but no, instead, God's call was upon him. And what is God's call? Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Verse 16. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Is there anything in that verse that cannot be said about a Christian? That directly applies to you, if indeed you are a Christian. Any person that hears my voice and believes the Word of God, has received it. Now what do I mean when I say believe? Do I mean, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe that He was born of a virgin, and I believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and I believe in a personal and real devil. That's four out of the five points of what's called fundamentalism. It's not a mental assent to some outward things that are in the Bible and that men teach. That's what Romanism is. That's what even false religions are. There are outward things that men teach, but there's no personal revelation. Some Calvinists, some Christians, would make the Bible and Christianity into such a philosophical, scientific, and mental process that they would knock out the idea of a personal revelation, of a personal relationship. But in fact, true Christianity is predicated upon a personal revelation of Jesus Christ to yourself, and it's predicated not upon your intellect, it's not predicated upon your ability, it's not predicated upon anything within you. It's predicated upon something without you that's been revealed to you. Revelation knowledge of Jesus Christ um, look over to Galatians chapter 1 for a moment. I've been very strong on pressing this point over the years, and there's a reason for this, because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And in his work, what we find is that he presses the idea, the notion, the doctrine, if you will, not of having an outward assent and a mental assent or a mental apprehension and understanding of all various doctrines in the Bible, and that makes you a Christian. Not that you agree with this, this, and this, 
though it's good to agree with this, this, and this when they're true, but rather a personal revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Galatians 1, 15, 16, and 17. But when it pleased God, it all starts with pleasing God. Whatever pleases God, that's what occurs. Who separated me from my mother's womb. Paul here ascribes responsibility to the sovereign power of God for not just himself, but every child that separated from his mother's womb with life and called me by his grace. No man is called except by the free, unmerited favor of God. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. I've dwelt upon this verse before at length, but this is precisely what our brother just pointed out earlier is not being preached when it pleased God to reveal His Son in me. Paul speaks as if the Son were already there and was just simply being unveiled to His mind and to His spirit and to His heart. When it pleased God to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen. Now, that section, that phrase would be used by many to say, well, this just comes concerning the call of this apostle and ministers of the gospel and has nothing to do with the individual Christian. That's a lie. Because Paul is a pattern of God's long suffering to those that should hereafter believe on Christ to life everlasting. He said, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I conferred not with what flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem. He didn't make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. As soon as his conversion occurred, his great goal and desire was not to plant the cross in the center of Jerusalem, like some who claim to have a conversion. It's odd. They're converted, but it's not by Christ. They're converted not by the man Christ Jesus, but they're converted by a woman. Mary, the mother of God. Neither went I up to Jerusalem, to them that were apostles before me. Now you would think that in flesh and blood and with a carnal understanding and even a spiritual understanding, it would make sense to want to have a rap session with Peter, right? And James and John and talk to some of the other disciples. But no, he didn't want to do that. There were two Jameses now. There was one that was executed and there was another one. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. He didn't go to a school of the apostles to learn to be an apostle. He didn't go to a school of the preachers to learn to be a preacher. Right. There is no ordination or laying on of hands in the Bible that guarantees any sort of apostolic succession or a succession of being able to preach the truth from one man to another. I don't know how many deacon boards and boards of elders and presbyters have laid hands upon how many men that have no unction from God whatsoever and no personal revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. See, laying on of hands availeth nothing when it's done by carnal men onto a carnal man. He said, I went into Arabia and returned again onto Damascus. He went out in the middle of the desert. Arabia is a desert. He didn't say he hung out with the Ishmaelites. He wasn't with the ancestors of the Al Saud family. He went out there and then came back to Damascus. Then after three years, after he was established and rooted and grounded in the faith, as taught by Jesus Christ personally to him, then he began to have fellowship. Then he began to hobnob with the other preacher guys. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But the core essence of Christianity is this. God reveals His Son in you. And you don't confer with flesh and blood about it. You don't ask someone else's opinion about your experience. You know for yourself that you have an experience with God. Their Calvinists would say, that's all wrong. You have to believe all these doctrines. Well, not everybody is gifted with as much intelligence as others. Not everybody is gifted with the same mental apprehension. But everybody who is a Christian, everyone who is a Christian, must have that same personal revelation of Christ within them, or they are none of His. You either have Christ in you or you don't. But see, 
Christ in you, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Every child of God eats the word which was made flesh, only they don't eat him in the flesh. They eat him spiritually. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. He's formed all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. You eat this book up, and you're literally consuming living off the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that Newt Gingrich just joined a Catholic church following Tony Blair, and I'm sure George Bush W, I mean, is yet to come. They're all getting a revelation that the Pope is the Son of God manifest in the flesh. And they're joining the Romish church. Apparently all political roads in this country lead to Rome. Why am I saying that? Because Rome has nothing of the spirit of Christ. Rome is a persecutor. Rome, actually the canon law is nothing more than an extension of the old Roman civil law. That's all it is. It's an extension of Roman imperial law. Only they've switched to the imperators, the emperor. It's just a little change. But you will either serve man or you will serve God. You will either fear man or you will fear God. You will either fear them that can kill the body and can do no more, or you will fear the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you fear the Lord Jesus Christ because he can, after he's killed the body, can cast the soul into hell, that fear ultimately turns to a love. And what is it a love of? Thy words were found and I did eat them. I did eat them. Why did he say he ate words? Well, that's a common expression in our language, isn't it? Not to eat my own words. Or eat my hat, as some people used to say, but I'll eat my own words. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Now we know one thing of a certainty, that the word of God is not a joy and rejoicing to those that would forbid it from others, is it? It is not a joy and rejoicing to those that will not preach it to others. I would submit that the individual preacher in that individual church we heard of earlier before I got on the uh, video here and started actually preaching this sermon, the Word of God is not a joy and rejoicing to his heart. Because if it was, he would communicate it to others freely, without reservation, and without regard to the consequences. When you tell people that they can die in their sins and go to hell, even though Christ died for them personally and they know it, you're in it for the money. You're not in it for the Lord. You're in it for yourself. It's sinful and it's wicked. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Did he say, I call myself by the name of God? Or God has called me by his name? Which is it? There's the difference. I sought not in the assembly of mockers. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sinneth in the seat of the scornful. For what? His delight is in what? The law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. The law of the Lord, well, the whole Bible is the law of the Lord. But the law of faith is the ultimate delight in the child of God concerning God. Because we stand by faith, we walk by faith, and we live by faith. I sat alone because of thy hand. There's a certain separation that happens. I am despised by the Christian men that I looked up to when I first became Christian. I'm looked upon as a wild man, as a person who is out of order and out of line because I will not submit to human authority in religious matters. I have to submit to pastor so-and-so because after all, he started a great, glorious church. It's got thousands of people in it. And he's now got a PhD. And he went to Puke State University, the same place that I dropped out of. And he got authenticated. He got stamped with a seal of approval by a really godly institution. A wicked institution. All human institutions ultimately become wicked. When, they're inst when something's instituted of God, it's instituted in the sense that individual men, individual people, men or women, either one, are given a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
what revelation sticks? Is God an eternal God or not? Is he a real God or a false God? Is God an idea that you've developed in your mind and that you've received from some sort of schematic given by men? Or is God real and personal? Can you know God the same way you can look and know your neighbor if you speak to him? The Bible says that you can, and the Bible is the means whereby this occurs. Because the Word of God communicates the faith of Christ, and that faith of Christ locks you into a love union with Christ. He said, I sat alone because of thine hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. When you're saved, when you're born again, you become indignant and vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. You become disgusted at the lies and how people make lies their refuge. You become disgusted with the deceit and the insanity around you. You become filled with indignation because men are so against God. You couldn't be filled with indignation if you didn't have Christ in you. No woman, no man, is indignant because of sin in this world, because of the sinners in this world, on their behalf, for their own sake. Oh, they may be angry because someone did them wrong, but ultimately they would do the same wrong to another if it profits them. It's only when you have Christ in you, a revelation of Jesus Christ, that you actually can care for the Lord and take His part. Um, now, turn over to Psalm 139. I chucked my outline for the day. And we're going to just follow the trail of the Scriptures in a different manner, I guess. But in Psalm 139, this is a psalm of David, a man after God's own heart. Now, this is, again, something that couldn't be taught at Puke State University, something that won't be taught at the... First Church of Godly Vomit. Now, this won't be taught in the Porta Potty Church because it's not popular. Down at the bottom. See, they like to point out up at the top in Psalm 139 that God searches and tries the reins of the heart, that He knows everyone's down sitting and uprising, um, that He encompasses our path about, that he knows all our ways, and that we can't go anywhere where he's not. I like to preach that. But somewhere down through the middle of the psalm, all of a sudden, they drive off the cliff. Verse 19. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked. See, the tone of the psalm changes. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God, Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. All lost people are men of blood. It's only God's restraining hand and providential hand that keeps them from all murdering their fellow man. Isn't it interesting that the first murder was out of one brother to another? And is that not what the whole principle of persecution is in this world? Because you are our brothers in Adam, and you won't be our brothers in the... Lord's Christ, which is not the Lord's Christ, therefore we have to kill you. That's the thinking behind the persecution. That's the mentality. So the example is set in the slaying of Abel by Cain, and then it follows down through generation after generation. Galatians chapter 4 said, He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, meaning Isaac. Isaac was born again. And his son, Jacob, was redeemed by an angel. Joseph knew the Lord and worshipped Him in spirit and truth. These men all had the same spirit, the spirit of Christ in them, which spoke aforetime. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly. Why is he angry? Why is he upset? Why is he filled with indignation? Because they speak against God wickedly. If you really love God and He's inside of you, doesn't it vex your soul when you hear people speak wickedly against God? It's one thing to hear a man speak against another man. But when sinners rise up in rebellion against God and vilify the most wondrous, beautiful Savior, the greatest man who ever lived or ever could live, 
and don't cease from it, and make that the center and goal of their whole life, which is what they do, does it make you angry? Thine enemies, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Now immediately, you know what you think in your mind? But someone's saying, Jiminy Cricket. Oh, old Walt Disney, what a wonderful. Oh, Jiminy Cricket, that's okay. You know what that is? That's a mockery of Jesus Christ. Walt Disney was a vile, wicked, evil person. That whole corporation was founded upon movies which were filled with witchcraft and sin. Jiminy Cricket, that's what they say instead of Jesus Christ. And he just appears, doesn't he? Uh-huh. Dirty old Freemason. But they take thy name in vain. So we're warned here against those that actually take the name of Jesus Christ, but they use it in vain, not in truth. Not that they're swearing by his name, but they're taking it in vain. They say, we believe in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, blah, 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 blah. And they march up and down in the church. You know, and they wear special outfits so everybody will know. I'm not just talking about Rome. Go to a Methodist church. Same thing. We have the Apostles' Creed, and we recite this every week. And we... You know how many people I know that go to those kind of places and don't believe any of that? See, the true faith of Jesus Christ is not what outward creeds, outward statements, and mental will say, Oh yeah, I believe in God because it doesn't make sense if there's not a God. No, this world had to be created because it all seems to work and fit together somehow, even though it's kind of crazy down here. Therefore, I believe in a God. And I can agree with Muslims. We all believe there's a God. And I can agree with Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe there's a God. And they believe in Jesus. We all believe in the same Jesus. That's the way they think and talk. They take his name in vain. You know, you know what he says about that? Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? He says, all those people hate God. And therefore, he hates them. And we'll just title this Godly Hate. Godly hate of every false way. Because if you've got God in you, then you should have godly emotions, at least at times. We understand that we are imperfect, that our flesh is rotten, that it is wicked, that it is corrupt, and that we're in a war with the old man. So we don't always do those things that are right. But even when we do those things that are right, even when we do that which is good, it's tainted by our flesh. Even our best works are in some sense imperfect. Yeah. Romanism teaches that our good works can be perfect. These so are all false religions. If you do perfect works for Allah, you will go to Allah's paradise, where everybody can fornicate and get wasted all the time. And do all these fleshly things that you won't have in the true heaven. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am I grieved with those that rise up against thee? Are there people that just being in their presence grieves you, makes you sick? They're all over America. You don't have to look far. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. See, this is the same issue that Jeremiah had. It was that he was surrounded by people that hated God, took his... The Jews all said, we serve the true living God. We believe in God. We, God spake to Moses, and therefore we believe what Moses said. That's the problem. Remember the Pharisees? They always appealed to Moses. They didn't appeal to God himself. They appealed to a man that God had revealed himself to. I'm not appealing just to the Bible when I preach. And you can bear witness, those of you that have been around for a while, what have I said? I've said I only have two things I can preach. My personal experience with God and the Bible. My personal experience with God was begotten by the Bible in Christ. Those are the only two. You know, strange. All my big Christian brothers that I looked up to, and so they taught me some things. I don't deny it. God even used them to speak to me. But none of them ever boiled it down for me like that. It's a personal experience. See, fundamentalism, if you just believe the fundamentals of the faith. When I gave them a recantation, a recitation of my personal experience with God, they wouldn't let me join the church. They said, nope, you're going to have to wait. They've decided that it sounds too experiential. 
It sounds too much of experience and not enough doctrine. And then when I came back a year later, I gave them a three-minute doctrine sketch. Amen, brother, amen. So I went home and I prayed about it, and I came to the conclusion as God spoke to me and said, look at your life, look what you are, look what you used to be and what you now are. Look what, how you used to think and how you now think. Look at what your heart was and what it is now and the effect it's had in you personally. And forget what they said. You know, that's the very essence of the Reformation. That's what Luther came to the conclusion. There is no forgiveness of sins outside of Christ. And the only way you can experience the forgiveness of sins is personally. If I tell you your sins are forgiven, that doesn't mean they're forgiven. That's right. Does it? Well, our preacher says that if we believe in Jesus, we believe what he believes, that we're forgiven. All those kind of people always say, I hope I'm going to heaven when I die. That's right. Forget it. You either know or you don't. You don't have to have much knowledge to know, and you can have a lot of knowledge and never know. That's really the very essence of the matter. But you see this violent, vehement anger towards those that would falsify the way of God in religious matters. They take God's name in vain. They take up the name of Jesus Christ. They take up the name of Christian for themselves. They took it up. It wasn't given them. They took it up. And there's always going to be a dispute. Look at Psalm 119 for a minute. The first um, nine verses. Something very interesting here. I've pointed this out before, but I would like to reinforce this. Blessed are the undefiled of the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. O that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall learn thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O forsake me not utterly. And then verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according unto what? Thy word. There are seven different appellations or names for the word of God in the first eight verses. And in the ninth verse, we have the eighth all-summing conclusive use of the word word, which encompasses all the rest. The law, the statutes, the judgments, the testimonies, the ways. That's the word of God. What is this whole psalm about? It's about a man that loves the word of God. He loves something that was outside of him, but was placed in him. He loves something that came to him because he literally couldn't come to it and do it himself. And that's all through this whole psalm. Now back to Jeremiah. See, he ate the words of God. There's a couple places in the Bible where you find men eating a book. You don't ever find them eating human flesh and blood. <laughs> Except in the book of Revelation is judgment. Give them blood to drink because they are worthy. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. What is that word? Everlasting life. I was asking my wife the other day, early on in her religious experience, there were people that taught her that when you were born again, if you didn't follow their set of rules, you were going to go to hell. And I said, well, how do they get around the word everlasting? How do they get around the word eternal? It, it, it seems to be a big block in a wall that they can't handle. And it's always a set of rules, a set of regulations that your imperfect flesh is to be subjected to and must keep exactly so that they can tell you that sure you're going to heaven when you die. That's the whole issue in life is where you're going when you leave here because you're going to leave. And where you're going when you leave here determines how you're going to live while you're here to some extent. But more than that, it determines mostly how you feel and relate towards your fellow man. See, you can hate people because of their doctrine and because they take the name of the Lord in vain, 
and use it as his name, but don't believe in his power of his name, you can hate them and yet do well to them, and owe them nothing but to love them. You can have both things present in you at the same time. That's what I find in my own life. I see helpless, hopeless reprobates that I actually pity, and yet when they rise up in rebellion against God, I hate them. Can you pity and hate someone at the same time? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I sat not in the assembly of mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because thy hand now has filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual? Seems like it will never end. It just goes on and on and on. And my wound incurable. Won't this war within my soul ever stop? Which refuseth to be healed. Uh, the flesh can't be healed. Healed. It has to be killed. It has to die. And thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail. Jeremiah is in despair. He says, you sure you're not lying, Lord? Do you ever wonder if it was all true? That's what he's doing. That's his flesh. Will thou be unto me as a liar? He knew that God has spoken, but will God bring it to pass? God has promised something, but will he now do it? And as waters that fail, like the brook that dried up, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, If thou return, then will I bring thee again. Well, in the psalm it says, The Lord will bless thy going in and thy coming out from this time forth and even forevermore. If thou return, who gives you the ability to return to God when you've departed from Him in practice and thought and heart? But God Himself. If thou return, then I will bring thee again. If thou return. See, men would hang on that if thou return, then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth, he's being charged up by these words to continue with his mission. If thou take forth the precious from the vile, thou shalt be as my mouth. His words are the rejoicing, God's words are the rejoicing of his heart. And God tells him, you'll be like my mouth, because his word comes out of his mouth. Thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return out of thee. The man of God in the Bible, Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, and all of them in the New Testament, they stand outside the camp. And they call to men. They preach the gospel as it were to every creature. But they call, and they don't go to them. The men are what? Drawn. Let them return unto thee, but return thou not unto them. There's a drawing spoken of in there where Christ draws men to himself. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. That's a brass wall. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. I was in despair the other day, just feeling totally in my flesh, my mind and body afflicted, and I opened my Bible. And I wasn't looking for a verse, but I got one. Sometimes you find things that you're not looking for, and then you're looking for something, sometimes you don't find it. But they shall not prevail against thee. This world can't prevail against Christ. This world is going to bang up against Christ and be destroyed. And if you have Christ in you, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The word of God abideth forever. It's the incorruptible seed. And it may smash through your flesh, and your flesh will be destroyed. This world may mess up your flesh. But Christ in you will live forever, and you will live forever in Him. For I am with thee to save thee into liberty, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. You've already been delivered out of the hand of Satan. And you're going to be delivered out of the hand of man as well, if you're a Christian. But the only way you can ever get a revelation of that is not to let's figure out how we're going to live together and let's figure out what our purpose is and why we're here and then force ourselves into that purpose. That's not Bible. Bible is when it pleased God to reveal His Son in me. And now I'm going to read statements by a dead man who yet speaks. Um, this statement... I'll attribute it afterwards instead of before. There are two kinds of believing. First, the believing about God, which means that I believe that what is said of God is true. This faith is rather a form of knowledge than a faith. 
There is secondly, a believing in God, which means that I put my trust in Him, give myself up to thinking that I can have dealings with Him, and believe without any doubt that He will be and do to me according to the things said of Him. Such faith, which throws itself upon God, whether in life or in death, alone makes a Christian man. Then he speaks of those that have a false kind of faith. Quotes, they think that faith is a thing which they may have or not have at will, <laughs> like any other natural human thing. So when they arrive at a conclusion, say, truly the doctrine is correct, and therefore I believe it, then they think that that is faith. Now when they see and feel that no change has been wrought in themselves and in others, and that works do not follow, and they remain as before in the old nature, they think that the faith is not good enough, but there must be something more and greater. It's very interesting, all the movies that come out about the Catholic Church invariably have to do with losing faith. It's always talking about losing faith and coming back to the faith. I've never had that problem. There was a time when I had no faith, but since I've had faith, it's always been there. Right. And even when I didn't believe, he abideth faith, but we could not deny himself. Even when me, Nelson, in the flesh, had doubts, there was someone living in me that had no doubt. He totally trusted in himself, and he's well able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that great day. And I have a full assurance that all my sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven, no matter what my estate down here, high or low, rich or poor, free or bond, it doesn't matter. Again, this man speaks of faith. He says, quotes, It is living, busy, active, powerful thing, faith. It is impossible for it, for it not to do us good continually. It never asks whether good works are to be done. It has done them before there is time to ask the question, and it is always doing them. What, what is the good work of faith? It's that you believe on him whom God hath sent. What is the thought in the entire sum of our religion? Unwavering trust of the heart in Christ, who has given himself to us. Actually, I should read this rightly. Quotes, unwavering trust of the heart in him who has given himself to us in Christ as our Father. Personal assurance of faith, because Christ with his work undertakes our cause. That's the whole thing. That was Martin Luther that said those things. Thus the believing soul, by the pledge of its faith in Christ, becomes free from all sin, fearless of death, safe from hell, and endowed with the eternal righteousness, life, and salvation of its husband, Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day. We thank Thee for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for the testimony of Jeremiah and all the other men recorded in the Bible as far as their lives and their faith goes. And we thank Thee that is the gift of God. It is by grace that we say through faith and that not of ourselves. It is gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we believe, as all those that were called heretics believe, that we worship God after the way which they call heresy, believing all things written in the law and in the prophets. And therefore, we have good hope through grace, and we understand and know that Christ died for us personally, and that now that we live, we live unto Him, not unto ourselves, and that though we live imperfectly unto Him now, there will come a day when we will live perfectly unto Him, utterly and completely cleansed of not just present sin, but these vile bodies, and they will be changed from glory to glory, and finally be made over in the image of Him that gave Himself and died for us. We're grateful for these truths, Lord, because without them we would have no hope. And we thank Thee for communicating them to us.